our ranking is still pretty poor. Yeah. But somebody had a good experience and they told their buddy. And then that buddy. And would you reward them for telling their buddy? Was it like an affiliate program no, where? We, we, we've always stayed away from that. I think it's spammy. And you think people, affiliate programs are spammy? Yes. Can okay. I quote you? Michael? Thinks they're thinks spammy, spammy, they're cheap, and they're pretty crap. Yeah. Okay. So what was the most effective as a startup? Do you want to sit? Okay. Has it got alcohol in it? Oh, yeah. We have a drink of alcohol. Uh, Victor, can we have a Jack Daniels and Coke? Thank you. Um, so, so tell me, how do you st how do you go from like you're in you're in Hong Kong, you've got your mates in Copenhagen, you're using the Al Qaeda model to business, which is you know secret, like people around the world. How do you take it from you know true startup and start getting traction? I mean, what what? What so, was the secret? If, if you so, had to so write a book about that, what so, would you write about? So we've just written a book about it called uh, Startup Man, which is been coming out here in uh, December. Who wrote the book? Uh, so Mikkel, okay. uh, one of the founders, and uh, with a journalist. And uh, you go to the website startupman.com. It's called ghostwriting. In other words, you talk to a writer, they write it for you, then you get a book. So, so I've, I've read it, and he's written some of the stuff. So what's the trick? So what's the trick? Sorry, it's uh, hard work. Lots of hard work. So you just have to things which seem obvious at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, you know, you can't look up getting a credit card to buy a thing. Yeah. Uh, you can't look up getting a credit card to buy a thing. You know, you can't look up getting a quick return. You just have to keep talking to people, keep providing fantastic customer service. The people who sign up for your products, you send them uh, free Buddha machines, T-shirts, and whatever. Uh, even though they're paying you nothing or a dollar a month, and then suddenly you'll reach like a tipping point. And what was that tipping point? Is it based on time? Is it based on a number? Is it like the famous tipping point of ten thousand hours of hard work and something happened? Uh, it was it was a slow progress at the start. Uh, so the free because you were the evangelist, right? Your title was. Zendesk Evangelist. Yeah, which is a reference to Guy Kawasaki and Magnitosh Wayne, which is free now. Uh, Guy Kawasaki like, spoke at Wednesday. I know. I, I, I've tried to get him to invest multiple times. And Bell was, in, Bell was yeah. in awe. It's the only time I've seen Bell look like a teenage girl. And I bet you, you know, Guy, Guy Kawasaki was, you know, God. Yeah. I must regret he didn't do that. Just as big as his uh, Yahoo mistake. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, going back, I'm, I'm still curious about this traction thing. So you say stick at it. You, you stick at it, Reward you find people. ways uh, of communicating with these people who are signing up directly on the internet somehow. So, you so you you send them it's emails. more concrete, find ways of communicating with them, what, what do you mean? So, so pe people want to communicate in different ways. So yeah. some people don't want email, some people want you to talk to them via phone, somebody you want to like a demo. You just have to offer them these choices and they'll take one. And you were doing this all by yourself, out of Hong Kong, yeah, as so the evangelist? Initially, uh, I was doing it all, and then we hit a, a point where I couldn't uh, continue. Uh, also because it, most of it was in the US, uh, so I was working for my... So well, what I, stage did Copenhagen move to the US? So we, we, did, we moved first to Boston when we had hit our Series A, and quickly thereafter B when we went to San Francisco. Can you put some numbers on that? Is that public information? It is public, but I can't remember, okay. to be honest. Yeah. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter now. No. <laughs> it mattered considerably then. So, so, I, so you were doing this all by yourself, and you go, fuck this, I need, sorry, you said, uh, so, so I should say about, about that, and most of the invest. I think it's important, uh, I see a lot of people now, they're getting kind of money to design their product. We didn't do that. The free founders, and that's why the free founders, they cut off bits of their ears, and for two years before, I joined when we launched and we were actually. Wait, 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 you said something very weird that they cut off bits of their ears. Yeah. Uh, was Van Gogh one of your founders? No, but it's, it's, you know, he did his stuff for art, they did it for the company. They cashed in their pensions, they borrowed money, they did, uh, okay. you know, cleaning jobs. Were they developers? They were developers or they were? Yeah, so developers, so developed designers, yeah. and also getting financing and, you know, uh, the whole idea about the product. And I think that that's important, a bit like uh, bands and stuff. You need pain and suffering, <laughs> and you need to have a product, and you need to have a business model, and people you buy you cry. Cry. I need to get some before decisions. you start getting all this money in. Otherwise, it's it's and you see all these things. Yeah, but he's in, he's in, in in you know California. If you said that to any startup in California, pain and suffering. There's a famous um, um, acronym. I hear, and I use a lot because I hear it, is URL. Do you know what that stands for? No. 
ubiquity first, revenue later. It's a famous Californian Silicon Valley thing, which is don't care about the money first, get the revenue later. So, so it would have been nice, so, but when we launched 2007, there was 2008, there was not a lot of money around. Yeah. But that also meant that I think our product and the way that we put everything together, our ethos and stuff, is kind of low price, high value, which meant that we could get lots so of... So how much does it cost to use your product? If so like from, from nothing to as much as you want to give me. Right. So yes. many, many of our... So we have our customers, you know, there's over 45,000 of them, uh, in 140 countries around the world, and they pay from nothing uh, to, you know, a dollar a month to thousands of dollars. So, at what point did this tipping point happen where you went, This is a serious business? Were you sitting, so, so were you they, sitting in, in Saiwan Ha in Hong Kong and you're saying, Jesus Christ, there's a hundred people who bought our software? Yeah. So, so, you know, you start off with having one sign up in day and then you have 10 and suddenly it's in the hundreds. And I think it happened after about six months. Then, oh, we're onto something here. Yeah. And uh, at that time, we, we needed help. And it's kind of interesting, you can get good uh, labor here in Hong Kong, and uh, so we don't have a lot of money. So I found two students at Hong Kong U. Who There's a couple of students from Hong Kong U, right? Yes. MBA uh, students. Yeah, but we can't use them for that. So I found <laughs> some who were studying social services because we were speaking to IT people. And I thought people with kind of social services and stuff would be Because IT people don't know how to communicate. Exactly. <laughs> and, they, and they were... And they all have mental problems. And I think... They, Aaron, only in code. And I think we paid them like nine or eighteen... So you came to Hong Kong. Is Jane still here? Is that Jane? You came to Hong Kong for cheap labor. No, we didn't. I came here because my wife was here. No, no, but while we were here... It fitted in very well. Oh well, you were cheap. You were cheap labor. Yeah, you didn't were free. anything. <laughs> so what happens? Like after two, after a year and a half, you go. Mm, I wouldn't mind a little bit of income. And what do you say to Mikko? No. Do you say, look, mate, I've done this for a year and a half. Give me some dogs. No, 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 no. There, there are some agreements in place and things like that. So it's not necessarily you got, free. Oh, you got, oh, it wasn't free. I see. No. Sweat, <laughs> sweat equity. So, so you're here, and then what happened? Do you start seeing that actually America's more important? Like, if you're if you're a global startup, right? Because you, in, in, what you're saying is, you had a business originally in Europe, you came to Asia, your guys moved to America. At what stage did you start saying, forget about the rest of the world, America's where it's at? So we've never done that. So, so it's the internet, and it, we always had like a twenty-four-seven operation. We don't care where you are. We'll service you. But isn't it really hard to have twenty-four? So no, no, you no, really. have to have like a, a call center in the Philippines, something in Europe, something in, in it's different times. So, so, so we use this great product called Zendesk. Um, <laughs> oh, really? You use it yourself? Yes, we do. You practice what you preach. Exactly. Nice. So, so originally it was, was me here, the three guys in Denmark. Then we got two students here who work during the day yeah. at one of the class. And then I found Grace who was here in the back and she had two children while working for us. So she would take the night shift. So every time she was breastfeeding, she was uh, doing tickets and speaking to customers in the US and Europe or wherever. So Zendesk gave birth. <laughs> Something like that. So then we found a guy in Argentina. Then we found uh, two guys in America. And it's always been like that. It's been very odd. And these were people who were working remotely. There was no need. Yeah, we first got a, an office when we went to Boston after two and a half years. Two years. years. So I want to know a bit about the product. I mean, how do you start, you know, now you've done an IPO, there's pressure, right? You've got to show that you're doing things. Does that mean you have to keep on launching new products? I saw there was a, there was a new product like Inbox or something that Zendesk has launched, right? So have you got to keep on telling a story and saying, look, we're still at it, we're spending your money, this quarter we're launching Inbox, or so next quarter we're buying this company, next quarter we're doing this. I don't think there's, there's a big difference uh, between where we kind of gotten to before we became public. Uh, it was a kind of it was a natural step for us with the size and also the rigor you have to put in place to control a large business with many customers. And also, I think that the customers were also really looking towards it because there's many large companies who are kind of very dependent also on us and want to have be a stakeholder in that somehow, which you are if you're a public company. Um, it's it it's you know it, it you, you suddenly you have a different kind of money 
Uh, being a public company, can you, you pay a salary? Are they paying you salary? Yes, they are. <laughs> so, being a public company, you know, is it a real salary? Is it an American salary? It's a real salary. It's oh, very nice. nice. Uh, Why are you still wearing a shabby t shirt <laughs> with holes and a pair of jeans? So, so um, because I'm expecting you to wear the first version of the t shirt, the second I lost version it. of the t shirt. Uh, no, but when, when you have access to cheap funds, you can do some, some which that's the cheapest way to have, have money in the stock market. Okay. So only you can do some of the things that you couldn't do before. For when example? You, expand your, your proper product offering. As in? As in, we, back we, we, we acquired a company in Singapore that does fantastic chats. Why did you do it in Singapore? Why didn't you do it in Hong Kong? So we, we, we wouldn't say... Uh, Jane, slap him. I'm here again. Slap him. Have you got some handcuffs or some pepper spray or something? <laughs> no, she can have a talk. It'll talk later, yeah. so, so You were in Hong Kong, you went away, back to Australia, then you came back invested in Singapore. How dare so, you? So it's got nothing to do with where they were located, it's a fantastic product. And what, what's it called? Sopim. Sopim? Yeah, Z-O-P-I-M. Uh, I, guess, I guess now it's called Zendes Chat. And what? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds better. What does Zopim do? So they do a, a chat product. Uh, chat like like a kind of Jabber type thing. Uh, yes, like a, a close you, you, go, you go to a website, you can press the chat button. You go to a website. Oh, live you've been there. All that stuff. You've been there for five minutes, hovering over this button. Do you need help? Oh, it turns off and things like that. It's very cool. Why did you find that in Singapore? Why didn't you find it in like Croatia or? So, so it could have, could have been. So we we looked at um, uh, numerous other products, but this mm. was the best. Um, and it, so I think one of the things we've also done a lot is to work with startups and uh, developers. So we have lots of integrations, we have APIs, SDKs, and stuff. So is that a thing? So, 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 so we have numerous chat partners, and this is so we can see this is a great product. I see. Okay. Yeah. So I've I've seen it a lot. A lot of the cloud. If you move into the cloud business, it seems like the way you scale is that you basically open up your APIs, right? Elon Musk is doing it with cars. You've got um, the green elephant, what the fuck is that called? Evernote. Evernote. Send those cards in <laughs> Yeah, sorry, two beers. Um, Evernote, and these, they're, they're all opening up. They're, once they have a platform, they basically say, we need to spread this rapidly like a virus. So we'll open up our APIs. Is that the secret, you think, to being a, so, a so good cloud business? Is you basically need to say, I want any developer out there to be able to plug in something to what we have. I mean, the base camp. 37 Signals guys did it, right? Evernote did yeah, it? So, so we did it from the start as well. So we okay. looked at what David had done, of course. We were also on Ruby on Rails. So we've always had an API and we just made them better over time. But do you think that's a secret of getting that adoption quickly think, is to have yeah, an open platform? I think that's very important. It's also very important for the customers. And I think it's also very important for you as a, as a business. Uh, so for the customers, they should be able to say, Screw you! You're not good enough. We're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. So they can do that with Sendex, and also that also as a company keeps you on your toes. So you have because to keep more from innovating, you. keep you know making your product better. Not necessarily adding stuff, but you can also simplify, which you're referring to inbox before, which is like Sendex 2007 or something like that. Uh, so, so you, you but Evernote like does this, and then they, they go and acquire the companies who do the best jobs. That was quite an interesting program. Yeah. You basically open it up, open source. You then have an annual contest for the person who's used your API the best, and then you buy them. Sounds like quite a good business model. Yeah. Are you doing that? Not yet. Why have you come back to Hong Kong? Uh, is it, are you the foreign influence that the CY Lang was talking about? <laughs> 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 I don't think so. No, um, you look like it, shabby yeah. teacher. So, so I've, I've been doing this for, for, for seven years, uh, and in that time I was first evangelism, was, you know, and then I went to the US when I started my sales. When you went to the US, did you keep the evangelist title? Did, they, no, or did you no. just change it because they thought you were from the southern state? So, so we became much more formal, so I was the VP of sales, but I also had support. So you couldn't keep your cool startup name right. like Evangelist. We had to be serious. The right. investors understood what I was doing, and there was business development. Then I came back to 
my, our adopted uh, Australia, which is now with the Danish, but that's kind of our permanent home, I think. Who knows what's going to happen, of course. Uh, and, uh, and set up the APAC operation, which went from, we had Amy, who's here, in Hong Kong, and that was it. Did you have a baby as well? It seems to be a thing, a running no, thing. No, no, a couple of days. <laughs> oh, right, nice. Yeah. Uh, and that is now grown to, I don't know, 120, 150 people. In Hong Kong? No, in Melbourne, Tokyo, Manila, nice. Singapore. So, uh, and then during that time, uh, just this year, I've traveled for like 120 days. So do you have a clone in China? Zin Desk? Or Zong Desk? Or <laughs> Zin Desk? There, there are some things that look remarkably similar to Zin Desk. And are they doing a good job? Because I know Evernote has a, a clone in China. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't, honestly don't know, but that's one of the things why I've come, or my wife has come back to work and I need to not work quite as hard, hard anymore. And so I'm looking at China, so there's anybody out here who's got experiences with China? In terms, of, in terms of what? Uh, how do, are we going to grow our business there for the, from the hundreds to the many, many thousands of customers there? Well, China needs to change its whole approach to customer service, but different story. Uh, so so uh, you have some companies who are groundbreaking, some of the Chinese companies uh, who are doing some very innovative things for customer service. Uh, so I think that's, that's too general. So are you, are you becoming a, a data, big data company? So because you, you must gather so much information about what people say when you launch a product or whatever. Is that, is that become very useful analytical stuff or do you not really look into that space? It is uh, very useful. So you can go to a page called sendbass.com slash benchmark or something. And uh, as a customer, you can, I'll, I'll rather wait. I'm going to spill it or something. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and we are 45,000 plus customers can opt in and then they can uh, benchmark against others. And we also correlate that uh, data. And I think uh, end of this week, start of next week, the latest report is coming out where we look at particularly cu customer satisfaction. And you can look by country, industry, uh, size of business, and go across all kinds of different These are generic things. reports, right? They're not, they're not saying- They're specific to you as a business if you're a CentOS customer. And then they, you can go in and slice and dice in the, all the data we've collected. Because there's a big, there's a big, you know, if you go to any digital marketing events nowadays, there's this term that's used thrown about a lot. It's a single customer view, right? Are you are you part of the single customer view? Have you got enough fingers in the pie to be part of the to cover the single customer I, view? I think uh, statistically, with more than forty-five thousand customers, we have some good data. Yes. Yeah. So you can do a whole customer journey from somebody looks for my product, they buy it, they're not so happy you, with it. You would, you would many times use multiple products yeah. as part of your, your business, your online site, but we would be the customer service part of it. So how are you working with other, do you work with Salesforce and all these CRM systems, do you plug yeah. into, because uh, what I find confusing from a buyer's business, small business, is you go out and you want to manage your customers, there's so many tools out there, do you use, 37 signals, do you use you know, Salesforce, which has got the world's clunkiest interface? Do you use Get Satisfaction? So, so it's a, there's many, many businesses around the world. There's a massive market and there's a massive offering. So it could be from paper to post-its to yeah. using email to using a CRM or just a database or whatever. And uh, we, we fit in there somewhere and we kind of spur across a multitude of those things, uh, and it, it, you know, many people start with Sendesk, other people start with a CRM, and some put them together. And but I've, I've I've been using Airbnb recently, right? Sendesk customer. Oh, really? oh yeah. So anyway, <laughs> oh yeah. So what, what I found is, you know, I bought things on the internet, and I sold it. You sold it. Good on you. They came. They came down. We just gone to San Francisco, and they just gotten some funding, and they wanted to see us. And they, they, I think it's three founders, and they were, were sitting there, you know, we're like three people, and we've got this, and you know, we're going to do this, we want to check out your serious company. And I was sitting there, all my lawyer, there was like two people out in the office, yeah, we, we're like 20, I don't think we were 20. <laughs> it was a very funny meeting. Where so, so wait, tell, me, tell me, I think the customer service thing is changing because of companies like Airbnb or Uber or all that. 
Ja, hur ser det som helst? Ja, nej. Jag kan inte tänka på det som är en customer. Bolay Digital? My company? Oh, yeah. Så, oh, yeah. so, so, if you look at the way that customer service is done, it's been pretty clunky. Like, the whole experience, when you buy online particularly, is horrific. Yeah. It's horrific, right? Even with live person, can I help you? You know, the horrific. But isn't this kind of interesting that, that both Airbnb and Uber, what they're really doing is customer service? No, they don't do any of it. They outsource it to the person selling to you. No, no, but it's crowdsourced customer service. That, that's not true. They provide the people who are doing the customer service and holding the whole thing together. No, I didn't look at it like that. Okay. I'm going to Seoul for Christmas. I write to somebody in Seoul who's got a nice apartment. Within seconds, they've sent a message saying, oh, I'll meet you at the train station. You know, how many children have you got? No, 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 no. It's a form of customer service that's taken on by the vendor. Yes. Right? Yeah. So what I mean is these kind of guys are introducing a new way of very touchy-feely. Because the internet has moved away from touchy-feely and has done a lot of damage because you don't know a human being on the other side. You suddenly see an algorithm sending you responses. I agree. So do you think this is changing the way that the whole it is. concept of customer yeah. service? And because then, I'm tired of talking to computers. Exactly. Or pro or you know, knowledge trees or whatever yeah. you call and it. And you'll go and buy from somebody who gives this kind of electronic human touch, whatever that is. Yeah. And it, I think it's interesting because it, it, it's, you know, it's what your expectations are. So sometimes you get asked what's good customer service and that's somehow exceeding the, the expectation. So, so, so for example, I, I had some issue with Google Mail today. If I, if I sent an email to Google that replied, that would exceed my expectations. And I would be very happy. I think they would have broken history if they replied. <laughs> so I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't find where to, how to send an email to them. So is that the trick when you've got an internet business, don't have a contact us page? No, you should have one. And you shouldn't listen to them, because they'll help you develop your product. Okay, so let's do a bit of future. Yourself. I want to do a bit of future gazing before taking some questions from the floor. What, what let's look uh, two, three years ahead from now, because you, you're an advisor, your title now is advisor to the CEO, is that right? It's special advisor, which is probably like... Well, special <laughs> advisor? <laughs> special yes. or special? Special. Special, special advisor. Yes. Does that mean that you've got the kind of window job like they have in Japan? It means like they put you on the corner and... No, I'm in the library, which is a step after the window. Oh, I see. Did you so, know that? <laughs> so tell us, I mean, I'm just curious, where is, where is the whole concept of it? Because the whole concept of a customer is changing, right? The concept of how you communicate outwards, inbound marketing outbound, is all changing. So how is the, the, the way that you deal with the customer once you've got them? So, so I think it, it's becoming... It, Going back to like you're going uh, down the, the street here and you go into a little vendor. That's the kind of interaction you're trying to do electronically. So you're saying the world's gone a full circle. We've gone from, you know, our poor saying here's your Apple Daily and here's, you know, a donut. Yeah. And, and then added with that you, many people want to solve it themselves and you've got to give them that ability. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to send an email. They want to go to a page and read what they need or search for the answer. So, so you're saying that basically you're making much more personal all over again? Yes. Will Oculus Rift change the way that we do customer service? I don't know what that is. Aaron, tell them. Uh, have you tried it out? I have both at the end. Has anybody here tried Oculus? Ah, good experience, bad experience? Good. 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 You have to check it out, man. I will. Advisor to the CEO. <laughs> All right, can we take some questions from the floor? Who's got a question? Can, can I, uh, I just want to say, uh, is Bell still here? No. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so Bell, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bell. Yeah, so we, we have these uh, machines, so if we get some good questions, we'll give them out. So there's a story about this. This is from a, a Hong Kong, a Beijing brand called FM3. They're called Buddha machines, they're very famous in musical circles. And uh, the first big press that we got was to uh, kind of uh, get one of these and then uh, I spoke to Bell, we put together a, a wall of these on the internet, which was in the New Yorker, in Gadget, Pop Matters and things like that, which gave us a massive uh, kind of marketing to cool people. So uh, thanks for that Bell. So I love that, a digital entrepreneur tells you to make a radio. Yep. And it gets you famous. PR. 
Still works. All right, so any so questions? It's beautifully simple, like send it. Any questions? Nobody wants to, oh, there we go. MBA student, all the way from India. I have a question, like, um, what I hear from you about Zendesk, the whole company, how it works, the kind of service that you provide, and what I know about different other uh, customer service systems, as we were talking earlier about the CRM Clarify, which was the previous company. So how would Zendesk differentiate itself from the other customer service providers in terms of positioning? What is the differentiating factor? How do you position yourself as, is it just another customer service uh, software in the market which you can choose or may not choose? Or what is so unique about that? How, what's your positioning? Uh, so I think most of our customers don't look at it that way. Uh, so they'll ask their friend who's had success with Zendesk and they'll go and, and have a look at, at, at Zendesk. I think if, if you look at it, we, it's a, you go online, it doesn't cost you anything for at least the first 30 days, and you can use it straight away. That's a massive differentiator. You don't need to install it, you don't need uh, consultancy skills to uh, configure it. So you, as a business, don't, there's, no, there's zero risk, it doesn't cost you anything, and you're going straight away. Sorry, that question is not worthy of a radio, so I'm going to move on. Another question? Yeah, it's not. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Hi. Now it's broken. So you said you, um, you listen to your customers and they'll help you develop your product. Yes. So I'm wondering how many people would need to say a certain thing or to what, at which point is the tipping point where you you think it's relevant enough or it's, it's significant? So, so when you're, you're starting up, you, you put together your, your product, you launch it, and then uh, people started using it. And then they'll, they'll tell you. And uh, initially it's the, the people you want to listen to when you become more sophisticated and you use forums or help centers to capture the information. And you can also look at the, the, the stuff that you, you don't really want to listen to. And then you get to a mature development organization like ours, where it's like a third is implementing, uh, of the development time goes for implementing the, what we think are the best ideas that uh, our customers come to with, us with. One third is kind of fixing the broken stuff, and, uh, and the, the last third is new innovative stuff that nobody's really thought about. Okay, so some of the things, it's been things you've been thinking of anyway, it's in your mind. So, so when you go back in time, uh, somebody uh, you know, said, uh, can you support Twitter? And we're like, oh, I don't know, what's that? But that was, you know, in the early days, yeah. when Twitter was spelled differently, T-W-T-R or something like that. Can you support Twitter? Oh yeah. Is Twitter a good customer service channel? Yeah. It's a... Uh, or do it's people just kind of blow off on Twitter? Uh, so I, I have a personal view on it, and that's... Uh, so I've been living in Australia, and the, one of the large telcos I'm a customer of, and I can't get a hold of them, and I can't figure out their self-help center. But I found out, because I've got some followers on Twitter, that if I just go out and scream something there, they'll call me within five minutes. So they have a department of 100 people listening on Twitter. Uh, but but you know, no but normal customer can, can find an entry and get help from them. I think that's sad. I know, I know some, uh, some traveling bloggers who are very clever. Before they go to a city, they'll say, I'm coming to Singapore, what's a good hotel in this area? These smart hoteliers go, oh, come to mine, I'll give you a special discount. So that there's an element of customer service before they become a customer, right? I'm still confused, where does customer service start and finish? Because to me, it's like one of these misnomers. I mean, you know, you it's, can be a customer. It's a whole but, journey, isn't it? Is it some kind of customer service? No, no, let's no, talk about that between <laughs> two philosophical. <laughs> Next question. Can you come in? I don't know how long this cable is. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how do you differentiate noise and uh, good feedback from customers? Uh, because I'm also in a startup and we've been listening to a lot of uh, like comments and there are a lot of people who are willing to pay. I, th I think uh, noise is uh, stuff you don't want to hear. <laughs> they're, usually, they're usually like, uh, it's probably uh, going to different verticals and all that, you know, like just small specialization. Yeah. But I just don't So, really so I, I think it, when, you're, when you're small, uh, st when you start up as a startup, it's important to shut a lot of stuff out 
and just you know only go after stuff that you're capable of doing. So for many years, some people have asked us for like a FAQ or a comparison, special benefits, and we'll send them back a link to sign up for a free trial. We we don't do that anymore. But 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 you know that that can take some of that noise away. Uh, sometimes uh, we've had some things that you can go and search on uh, in, the, in the media where we had some things with pricing and stuff where, where we did tell this is all, tell the, uh, went on Twitter I think and said this is all noise that didn't go down very well. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, we were smart and we started surveying our customers and we still do that very regularly. Said there's most of two things with NPS, 